Basin Focal projects were a set of 10 projects uh, initiated in about 2004, 2005 by the Challenge Program to understand what the linkages were between food and water and poverty. That was our, our goal there. We had a lot of anecdotal evidence, but we couldn't really put the story together, and so it was decided to have a reasonably comprehensive view uh, with detailed analysis in basins. Ten basins were chosen, uh, two in Latin America, four in Africa and four in, in uh, Asia. Uh, and um, it generated a huge amount of insight, new insight, into what was really linking uh, water, food and development. I suppose the first, first thing that was unique was that it, it was the first time we had a view from three continents. Um, so we, we had a very good insight of really what was happening. And these ten basins, they vary tremendously in characteristic from some of the uh, basins in Africa, the situation where basically they're, they're very, very early point in development, strongly agricultural, through to what you might call transitional basins, where there's a move away from agriculture, towards those such as the Andes or San Francisco or, or Yellow River in China, where really non-farm activities are, are beginning to dominate. And, and so the, the challenges put upon these basins is very different, and the characteristics and the opportunities within the basins are extremely different. So for the first time we got a, a reasonably comprehensive view of the situation, plus we got enough detail of what actually links these things within basins. So for the first time I'd say we understand in a general way what are the linkages between water, uh, food systems and uh, development processes. And that, 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 is, that is new. I'd say the first key message that we'd have is that you need to understand the range of support that river basins provide development. So don't focus too quickly on any one aspect. If you do that, you'll miss too many things. So that's, that's the first message we have, is that river basins support development in a number of different ways. In some cases, food is the most important. In other cases, energy is more important. In other cases, it's something completely different. And overall, don't forget that the river basin is an ecosystem that supports people. So if you damage, damage that, you're going to head for long-term trouble. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I'd say. The other thing that we found was that the potential for increased use of those ecosystems is quite substantial. That many of, in many cases, the ecosystem uh, use or the productivity of that use is extremely low, maybe 10% of the potential. So I mean that raises questions in itself why it's why it's why it is so low, but that also suggests there's huge scope for improvement there by increasing uh, water productivity, the beneficial use of water. And in this, the the real big one is rain-fed water productivity. In most of the rain-fed systems, we found very low. Uh, water productivity. In other words, there's substantial scope for development. The third key message I'd say was that um, we understood that these systems are shared by many different groups of people and yet the sharing arrangements are often relatively weak and so that is a, a major area for improvement. You can imagine this picture Development is going to exploit certain aspects of the river basin ecosystem. They're going to develop more rapidly, but that will have consequences to other groups and other parts of the ecosystem. So how, is that, how, how are those consequences going to be taken into account? And how are societies going to ensure that long-term damage doesn't occur to the ecosystem and to other people who, who uh, rely on it? So that's, that's the third one. And I'd say the fourth uh, main message coming out of that is that in terms of institutions that manage all of these things together, uh, what are the institutional arrangements and are these really capable of supporting that kind of development? And, and we found well, virtually all teams in all basins reported institutional fragmentation, that is, there was a lack of institutions to actually 
support the collective use of these resources. So that's that's a major human and political development that needs to be needs to be uh, exploited. Okay. Um, so, for instance, in, with respect to institutional arrangements, for example, we found that, or the team in the Nile found that uh, ministries of agriculture tend to be concerned with food, not concerned so much with water. Ministries who are concerned with water or with hydropower uh, do not have reference to, to food systems. <clears throat> Often ministries for development or social development will not have a good contact with that. So instantly you've got <clears throat> problems of fragmentation of ministries, fragmentations <coughs> of, uh, of uh, institutions that will prevent a more holistic view that is probably necessary for long-term planning. That's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, ministries have to operate within their own institutional uh, boundaries, but at the same time, somebody needs to take a more holistic view. Who is that going? Uh, the bright spots are where um, development has really maximized use of uh, the resources and we found that in some parts, for example, some parts of the Ganges, uh, in the Punjab and in some parts of the Yellow River, uh, there were incredibly highly productive systems. The water productivity was probably about as high as you could, as you could imagine it, which meant that the system had actually developed uh, towards its potential, and that pointed the scope points towards the massive scope for improvement elsewhere. But of course, that development itself risks running into a hotspot. Uh, if you develop a system without taking account of the consequences for the system itself or for other people within that system, then that can lead to problems of water scarcity, where one group of people are actually taking the resources of another, or where development has actually moved the system into a position that can be viewed as, as unsustainable. Those are hot spots, so we found those in, again in the Ganges or in the Indus, uh, in the Yellow River, which was, has some very well documented cases where the system had effectively developed beyond the capacity of the river to support it. And also areas such as the Limpopo where there, there were problems of historical uh, allocation uh, rights that were leading to some political conflict there. That were being adjusted there, so those could be regarded as hot spots as well. So you can see there's a balance between a bright spot in which development actually proceeds towards high productivity, towards hot spots where the thing has actually moved beyond the level at which it can be sustained and adjustment is needed. By far the biggest picture though is really one of what you might call dead spots, which is where the system is, is performing at a very low level of activity, and there it's a simple development issue. Uh, where the system is just not uh, operating at any level of activity which can be seen to be supporting the development demands being put upon it. And that's, that situation is found widely in African basins, in the, in the four African basins that were analysed, but it also occurred in parts of the other basins, including, for example, the Ganges, which generally has an extremely high level of demand, extremely high pressure, and some of these bright spots as well as hot spots but even in the Ganges, you can find areas where the agricultural system is operating at a pretty low level of productivity. So, you know, these are, these are signs for optimism as well as signs of concern. And I guess what you could say is that that is the intention of, of overall agricultural development, is to try and lift the level of activity of many of these agricultural systems. And, and that is really representing the scope for improvement. That's the big opportunity. Do you have any specific examples of where, you know, how much productivity can be improved? Well, if you're looking at African basins. Yeah, if you're looking at situations where productivity is, is less than 10% of its potential, then a, a doubling of that seems, seems quite reasonable, seems quite achievable, and that has huge consequences for food security. Now, I'm not saying it's, not saying it's easy, uh, uh, but what I am saying is that those are mainly rain-fed systems, so the consequences upon other users of water within those river basin systems are relatively tolerate, tolerable. They're, they're, they're easy to, to cope with. Um, but what is needed is actually a full development of the system. Here we're looking at situations in which we, we have problems of inputs, problems of access to finance, problems of institutional 
uh, failure, problems of difficult access to markets. So I'm not saying that it's a <laughs> it's an easy thing to achieve, and there are many people actually looking at that. What I'm saying is that if that can be achieved, then then therein lies the major opportunity for solving the food security problem without handing over a major problem of water security at the same time. Well, I didn't say that water scarcity wasn't an issue. What mm -hmm. I say is that it's not, it's not the only issue and in many cases it's not the main issue. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact the analyses from the basin found a, an often quite weak relationship, statistical relationship between water availability and levels, measured levels of poverty. And the reason for that is that there are many other things that will influence whether people are able to, to support themselves adequately, not just water scarcity. Although water scarcity can be a problem. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a massive, massive capacity waiting there in the system for agricultural systems to develop and to support people in their livelihoods. And there are a range of different issues that there. Uh, general development issues. I mean, do you want me to list them? <laughs> it's, it, would be a, it would be a pretty long list. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we are saying is that there appears to be the capacity available within the global ecosystem to support food and water needs uh, for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. But that it, in, in developing the system to meet those needs, what we're saying is that you need to take account of the fact that when you develop one part of the system, it's likely to have consequences to other parts of the system. But there is capacity there to meet foreseeable needs, yes. And I think actually the story is changing somewhat. Is that people, when people look at the data elsewhere, uh, they're realizing that there is a capacity to, to meet demands. But the question is, how is that going to occur? Um, that's a tricky question, but I, I would say for me, um, I would say it would be good to uh, take this new information and, um, and do something with it. And I would say the first thing that we need to do is get a better handle on what is driving change. Uh, for example, what impact is global climate change going to have uh, on these basins? Um, you know, how are those going to be developed? Um, how is general economic development? likely to drive change in these particular basins. We know some of the consequences of uh, not taking into account this. Mm -hmm. we, we know some of the consequences of not taking into account the full range of change, but we don't have a very detailed picture of, uh, uh, of what drives change in basins. And, and you know that would be very helpful. The other thing I think that would be particularly helpful would be to take a more experimental approach, I guess, and try and understand what can we do to support the development of institutions to help manage these changes. We can see from the Andes, for example, and, and in other places, that the payment for ecosystem services has some viability. Okay, what else can we think of to actually support processes like that that would enable different groups of people to come to mutually beneficial arrangements about sharing of collective resources. And, you know, I, th I would say we've only just touched the surface on that. So the huge scope, I would have thought, for, if you like, green, we talk about the green economy, but also we're talking maybe about the blue economy, uh, that it's much more than pricing. It's more about how can we learn to share these collectively used uh, ecosystem resources in ways that really support development.